Welcome everybody. Um, my name's Julie Willis. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne and I am a co-director of the Australian Centre for Architectural History, Urban and Cultural Heritage or ACAHAJ, which is um, delighted to host tonight's event. Can I first acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which this event is taking place tonight and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We really are, Akahutch is really delighted to be able to host tonight's event. We're a research centre at the University of Melbourne which seeks to promote a collaborative and cross-disciplinary approach to the critical research of architectural history, heritage conservation and digital cultural and landscape, urban heritage and design. It aims to encourage and develop the work of emerging scholars to build a new generation of researchers and industry professionals to facilitate new professional and community knowledge exchange and public debate, to engage with cultural and collecting institutions, government agencies, heritage professionals and others across the sector in Australia, the Asia Pacific region, region of the world, to influence heritage policy planning and practice, and to contribute to best practice teaching and learning in heritage and architectural history. And so tonight's event fits so squarely in what we do. We're here, of course, to hear about a new heritage study commissioned by Heritage Victoria with the Australian Lesbian, Lesbian and Gay Archives, which is entitled A History of LGBTIQ Victoria in 100 Places and Objects. I'm really looking forward to tonight's discussion and I'm sure it will be most interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Cool. Okay. And, and so, um, before I'll move move the slideshow on before we get started uh, to tonight's event uh, what did we find when we went looking for Victoria's queer heritage or what did uh, what did Graham Graham and Marina find so I wanted to introduce uh, both of our speakers for tonight uh, Dr Marina Larson is, is, is an award-winning historian uh, at, for her book uh, Shattered Anzacs Living with the Scars of War which won the Ernest Scott Prize at the, from the University of Melbourne when, after it was published. And she's currently a principal of Heritage Assessments at Heritage Victoria, where she researches a variety of historical places in that role. Uh, and she's been active in Melbourne's queer world since the mid 1990s. Um, Dr. Graham Willett, uh, uh, affiliated with the University of Melbourne, uh, he's, he's a historian of uh, Australia's queer past and he's been active in gay left and trade union politics since 1979, with a particular interest in making these histories available to wide publics uh, in books and articles and walks and exhibitions and so on. And so people from Melbourne uh, within, the, within the queer community would, would probably be, would know Graham or, or be aware of him and his work. I haven't introduced myself and my name's uh, James Lesh and I'm a postdoctoral uh, fellow in Akahutch. Uh, and my work looks at the development of, uh, of, of heritage conservation in the Australian context. And I suppose uh, one thing that really draws our research centre, but also draws me to this, is that this study is doing things a little bit differently. It's not heritage as normal, so to speak, and how it's often practised. And I think it's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to it as well about hearing uh, the ways that maybe we're querying heritage practice uh, through the through the processes of this report and the embedding the community at the centre of this discussion as well. But I'm not going to spoil any. I'm not going to spoil any more by talking further. Uh, I wanted to draw your everyone's attention to a, a hashtag for tonight, Akahatch, as well as a couple of relevant uh, Twitter accounts for those who are who are following. I'm going to say following on from on Twitter, uh, although everyone I guess can be here because we're on Zoom. And the other thing I want to draw your attention to is that uh, the Q&A is going to be run through a system called Poll Everywhere. So if you put that web address into your web browser now, or I'll put this slide back up towards the end, uh, pollev.com slash heritage, uh, you can actually submit questions as we go along. Um, and at the end, depending on how many questions we have and how people, res people are responding, it'll also be possible to vote on questions as well that you want to see answered. So I encourage you to pull up that website now or towards the end of the towards the end of the talk so with that i'll uh, hand over to uh, graham and uh, marina thanks good oh brilliant okay so as james said my name is marina larson i'm one of the principals of heritage assessment at heritage victoria and for those of you who don't know heritage victoria is 
it's part of planning. It's within the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning or DELP in the Victorian State Government. The main thing that Heritage Victoria does is to administer the Heritage Act 2017, which relates to protecting places and objects in the Victorian Heritage Register, as well as um, protecting and managing shipwrecks and archaeology across the state. Uh, Heritage Victoria also has the capacity to commission studies to identify heritage in Victoria and um, they're usually thematic on a particular historical theme or typological. Uh, ahead, please. James. And as um, James mentioned, I am part of the queer, I'm queer, I'm part of the queer community. So when I use the word queer, I'm using it from an insider perspective. Um, where did the Queer Heritage Project come from? Well, in 2018, the um, Andrews government made an election commitment to review the heritage processes to include LGBTIQ social history. So this project came to Heritage Victoria and we said, well, what should this review look like? What is queer heritage? Is it places? Is it objects? Where is it? How do you determine its significance? And does some of it already receive some recognition? Uh, next slide, please. So next slide, please. Being um, Heritage Victoria, the first place we looked at was the Victorian Heritage Register. In Victoria, heritage protection has two levels. The Victorian Heritage Register is for places of state level significance and there are, are around 2,400 places in the register. And uh, places of local level significance are in local overlays and there are 200,000 places in local overlays. So. Um, we found a few places in the Victorian Heritage Register. This is a beautiful residence outside Geelong called Coriel, built in 1849. And two women lived here. They um, actually commissioned the house to be built. They were buried together in a very um, effective relationship, which um, Graham will talk about at greater length later. Next slide, please. Um, there's also queer history at St Paul's Cathedral. Um, St Paul's Chapter House hosted Victoria's first gay liberation group called CAMP. Um, and it, it might not be visible to outsiders, but the Anglican Church in this regard has always been somewhat progressive. Uh, next slide, please. In the local heritage overlay, um, we have this 1930s industrial building in, in 810 Peel Street, Collingwood, and since the 1980s, this has been a, a sex club for men. Next, next slide, please. Or next. So what we find is that there are many places in the Heritage Register and local overlays, but the queer histories of the places are often not part of the official significance. So part of what this project is doing is making these histories more visible and showing um, the, the queer histories which um, people like Graham have, have known for ages um, and, and which are in plain sight. But aren't necessarily written down or um, at the forefront of people's minds when they walk past a 1930s industrial building. Next slide, please. Um, another part of the context in which this study is taking place is development pressures. We've seen concern by the LGBTI community at inner city development and particularly this came to the fore when the Greyhound Hotel was demolished in 2017. This has been a drag venue since the 1990s and this reflects a wider community concern around the loss of inner city heritage, whether they're queer or non-queer pubs and clubs, industrial heritage and, of course, places on larger blocks because land is, is valuable for residential development. Next slide, please. We've also seen in the last particularly 10 years, 
I think, a real um, surge in interest in queer objects. Organisations like ALGA, like um, the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives and some others around the world have been collecting queer objects and documents for many, many, many years. But what we have increasingly been seeing, uh, be seeing is uh, mainstream organisations like the British Museum, like the V&A, who are suddenly looking at their um, collections and queering it and, and having web pages say, here are the queer objects in our collection. And I know that Museum Victoria has done some work in this respect as well. Next slide, please. So the method that we have taken to approach this project is to commission the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives to write a history told through places and objects. And this report is due mid-2020. And what we hope to do and its purpose is to identify the most significant places and objects for the LGBTIQ community in Victoria to provide information for the heritage sector, to assist statutory authorities in their listings, to assist other heritage and collecting organisations, to provide information for commemorative plaques, history works and public artworks, and to be a model for thematic studies in queer heritage. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the first queer heritage study of its kind in Australia, so I think we, we feel like we need to set up a really good framework and methodology to do this. Of course, the study will also provide the queer community with a sense of its own heritage and value and also raise awareness more generally about the heritage of underrepresented communities. Next slide, please. In terms of providing the queer community with a sense of um, heritage and worth, I think it's worth reflecting that in 2019, the History Councils of Australia released a statement which, amongst other things, said that um, history, that is connection to the past, supports a sense of community identity and place, and that in turn promotes social cohesion, individual and collective wellbeing resilience. And I think this is, is particularly true for communities that have been marginalised or criminalised. Um, to have a, a sense that you're part of something larger, a, a longer and deeper narrative into the past is very affirming for queer people. Uh, next slide, please. So just to finish, I thought I'd um, uh, maybe preemptively answer a couple of questions that we've received um, when we've done a similar talk recently. James? Um, some people have said, why are you doing a history in, in 100? And, of course, it's based on the British Museum book, A History of the World in 100 Objects, and to that we're adding a history of places and objects. So it's about what material culture um, tells us about a history of a marginalised community and what that community itself values. Uh, next, please. And, of course, when we look at heritage, the question of significance comes up. Who is... Um, what is our, our threshold, our benchmark for significance? And we've decided it's significance to the LGBTIQ community in Victoria. So rather than applying a state level test or a local level test for significance, we're looking at significance within the community. We're not necessarily making any statutory recommendations. And as I've said, some places are already in the register or overlays. We're providing information about significance um, to, and statutory authorities can progress their own listings in, in the register or heritage overlays. So um, next slide, please. At this point, I'll pass over to Graham Willett from the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives to share some of what he's discovered for the report and do a bit of a work in progress. The goal, as Marina said, the goal of this was fairly straightforward. It was to produce a publicly accessible study which lists between 70 and 100 places and objects of most significance to the LGBTQ plus community across Victoria. The fact that we're calling it Heritage 100 gives you a sense of where we landed on the 70 to 100 spread. We knew this was 
we knew this was uh, available or uh, achievable because the Australian Lesbian Gay Archives has been collecting and preserving uh, all sorts of materials relating to Australia's rather queer history since 1978. Uh, there's over 500 shelf readers and that list there gives you a sense of the kind of materials that we collect, which is essentially everything, um, all of which we count as objects for the kind of purposes of something like this. Um, on the question of whether we could find places, this is more difficult, of course. Uh, if you wander around or really anywhere in Melbourne, the kind of development slash destruction is, is going gangbusters. And we often find ourselves on our history walks standing outside um, large modern buildings saying things like, well, on this site there used to be. I mean, but, uh, despite all that, I mean, we gave it some thought and we managed to come up with a bunch of places that we think qualify. So between what we have and what we know, we we're in a very good position to uh, explain, uh, to, to meet the demands of the, the uh, contract. There was a sense in which we could have, we could of course have done this on our own, I mean, that kind of, what we've got made that possible. But we decided instead to uh, encourage and seek community input. Partly, of course, because we thought we would probably turn up objects and places that we hadn't really thought about. Uh, and that, of course, turned out to be true. We got a lot of places that we hadn't necessarily turned our mind to. But the other reason for us as the archives is that even if it turns up uh, things that didn't count as heritage, objects and places, uh, nonetheless, that collection of information made a great deal of difference to us uh, and, and adds to, to our ability to collect. We have a number of projects now that can come out of this in terms of pursuing history and heritage uh, beyond the project itself. We did this um, by engaging, obviously, in terms of um, social media and uh, digital. The, one of the really interesting developments was the uh, Engage Victoria website, which is something established by the Victorian government, at which government agencies that are running projects can create a website into which people can feed information. So the one on the left there is the Engage website for this particular project. Um, and it uh, invited people to suggest places and objects, but also to provide reasons for why they thought that was important, uh, other groups and people that we should approach, any kinds of thoughts that they might have about this. Um, that was enormously successful. We got well over 150 responses and well over 150 suggestions because lots of people made uh, multiple suggestions about things that we should chase up. Uh, of course, we used Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Alga's web page and its Facebook page uh, have a lot of um, traffic, so that turned out to be quite useful. And also, this all happened during midsummer, or it started during midsummer which meant that on our own history walk, which we did this year in Fitzroy, uh, the Thorn Harbour Health, previously Victorian AIDS Council, did their history walk at Fairfield, so we promoted it there. Um, we did a talk unconnected to this, but something that we promoted through this at, at Hobson's Bay Library. There were public consultations. Um, one, the, the, the main one which took place turned out uh, turned up at Hobson's Bay Library. Uh, there would have been others except, of course, for the, for the shutdown that was uh, triggered by the pandemic. Um, that was a bit surprising, really. I mean, even before that, we hadn't had a huge response compared to the getting onto the website and making suggestions. People were much more interested in making uh, suggestions online than they were in actually getting face-to-face. -face. And I think we find that's generally true not just with the archives, but lots of uh, community participation. We had meetings with the National Trust, with Heritage Victoria's archaeologists, uh, individuals and specialists in the field of heritage. And we also found ourselves being buttonholed by individuals. Um, we could, for example, I mean, in fact, this is 
my example, coming home from the archives one afternoon on the tram down St Kilda Road, uh, and somebody from Thorn Harbour Health was on the tram and spent most of the trip giving me ideas for things that we must include from the history of HIV AIDS in Victoria. Uh, and by the end of that trip, I did had a much bigger list than I would have had previously. So that kind of level of engagement has proved to be really important in terms of making uh, the, the, the list bigger and more diverse than it would otherwise have been. One of the questions we had to deal with was the question of heritage versus history. Um, we tapped into the interest in heritage partly because that's what was in the government's uh, edu uh, election policy. The Heritage Victoria was the organisation that commissioned this work uh, and it came in terms of the contract and the agreement that we were looking for places and objects which speak to heritage. So we're asked to compile uh, a history of uh, places and objects of significance to Victorian queer history. Um, the distinction became fairly clear fairly easily for us, uh, whereas we wanted to focus on objects and places, and that excluded people and events. But we're not preparing a heritage study in the usual sense. You know, we're not relying upon the Heritage Act or the criteria and thresholds and so on documents. But were we proposing objects for inclusion on the Heritage Register, that's what you would be using. But we actually had a, a, a broader and an earlier, in a sense, process that we were dealing with. It's very much a preliminary survey of the field. Is there heritage? Are there 100 objects and places that we might reasonably include in our understanding of heritage? Of course, if at some point people want to advocate for the inclusion of objects or places that we've unearthed uh, on the Heritage Register, we would welcome that. But that's not what we're doing in this project. And that, of course, gives us a degree of freedom because even within heritage, the, um, the, the scope, for example, in the Borough Charter, which talks about uh, a, a much wider um, sense of, of what counts. So they talk about cultural significance embodied in the place itself. So there's your place, its fabric, its settings, use, associations, meanings, and so on, and also related places, and so on. This gives us room to manoeuvre around a, a heritage and a history that has to be unearthed. The second thing we came up with, or the second issue that came out of the emphasis on heritage, was uh, a quite an interesting criterion, criterion G, in the Heritage Register which talked about a strong or special association with a particular present-day community or cultural group. And that's who we're preparing. This is how we judge significance, not, as Maureen was saying, state-level significance or heritage overlays or whatever. Uh, it's an attempt to find out what would be significant to this community. It's worth making the point that this is really a community. Um, Community usually, of course, refers to a kind of geographical community, cities, towns, regions, or maybe an ethnic or religious community. Uh, and the LGBTQ plus community isn't a community in that sense. It's certainly not geographical, although you could identify parts of cities where there's a, a concentration, but that's only relatively large compared to the rest of the, 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 the population. The thing about the LGBTQ plus community is that it doesn't exist before the 1980s. There are people and there are events, uh, there are places and objects, but they don't add up to a community in the sense that we would normally use it. Um, a community is expressed in things like venues, bars, restaurants, cafes, uh, in advocacy, in advocacy, activist groups, media, festivals, literature, other representations, consumption, social groups, and so on. That, that's how we can talk about this being a community. Uh, and in that sense, it's rather different to not just a geographical community, but even to um, ethnic or religious communities, which will, in fact, have many of those things, 
The difference is, I think, is that we don't go back as far as they do. You can trace most ethnic communities, religious communities in Victoria back quite a long way, uh, except for the most obviously recently arrived migrant groups. But all of the others go back well into the early 20th and into the 19th century. But ours as a community, which has really only existed since the 1980s, and a community whose quest for its history and heritage has to grapple with the realities of a people who were criminalised, vilified, marginalised for most of our history, and whose felt forebears spent a lot of time not leaving traces. Letters and diaries weren't kept, or they were destroyed by the creators or by their families and friends in order to protect their reputation. Uh, a community whose places of significance were rarely publicly acknowledged and certainly not in any kind of valued way. Um, the knowledge of which mostly passes through the generations by word of mouth, either privately, which is the way it was until relatively recently, or more recently through oral histories, where that kind of places that matter emerge in the stories that we are given. There's also a question, of course, of research. Um, police and court records, newspapers, like the, the trove digitisation has been a great boon to this, this research, if you know how to do it. Um, and also community newspapers. Recently, Gale, a large American publisher, has digitised the, the newspapers and magazines of the Australian queer community, um, and they're available electronically through libraries, universities, and so on. This again has made it incredibly, very much easier to do that kind of research. Um, uh, so that's this, yes, that's a material, sorry, that's the material about the community and how it has operated. Um, I want to now look at just a few examples of some of the things we've found, the way what we've found has thrown light on uh, our understanding of heritage and places and objects of significance. Um, the first is Vala's Coffee Shop, and that's Vala and her coffee shop behind me, as well as on the image on the slide. Vala's would, uh, and the second is Club 80. They, both these places are protected uh, by heritage overlay, so the buildings are safe, um, but their queer heritage has not yet been acknowledged and isn't built into any of the kind of registers or even a broader uh, social understanding. Start with Val's Coffee Shop, uh, which is a very conventional kind of heritage place that, that, that we've identified. Um, Val opened her coffee shop in Swanson Street in 1951. Um, where the veg vegetarian restaurant is now, opposite the town hall, 123 Swanson Street. Um, and it was renowned for welcoming, as they said, all of Melbourne, really welcome. It was a place for people at the margins or not quite respectable. Of course, camp women and men, that's what homosexual people call themselves then, but also students, theatre people, artists, bohemians in general. It was a place that was welcoming to all those kind of people in a city that often wasn't. Vowles turns up repeatedly in oral histories of people talking about Melbourne in the 1950s. And in a sense, this is the obvious indicator of its significance. It's remembered strongly and fondly, even decades after it closed down. The place itself didn't have a very long life, although they went on to run other cafes and restaurants but it, it lingers on in people's recollection uh, of their, their youth. But it's also important in the sense that it reminds us there was a different kind of Melbourne in existence in the early 50s. It coexisted with, but was different to, the dual respectable Melbourne, which is the one that uh, we tend to, to uh, think about when we think about Melbourne in the 50s. There was a Melbourne that welcomed diversity and openness and the unconventional. Uh, in, in, that was quite important for those who wanted to engage in that kind of life. Club 80, uh, seen here uh, at the building that Marina was saying in terms of the heritage overlay, uh, a sex club for gay men, well, not just gay men, for men, um, in Collingwood. 
It is currently being dismantled. The building is protected, but of course the interior isn't, uh, and the owners have uh, sold the building, and it's now being turned into offices. What's interesting about this is that we've, you know, we've known for a very long time that it was there. We could easily have included it in the heritage report as a kind of place of significance, but its significance has become really clear in recent weeks uh, with the kind of outpouring of comments and recollections and indeed even grief in some ways on Facebook from people who have uh, engaged, uh, participated in, in life inside Club 80 since it opened in the 1980s. That is, it's the cumulative significance of many. There's also a place like um, the Prince of Wales in St Kilda, again, which is still there. Um, it's built in, in its current form in 1937 and designed for and attracted to and attracted what was called at the time the smart set, stylish and cosmopolitan Melburnians, which included the camp crowd. Again, camp being the word we used to describe ourselves really until 1972. Um, and so it has a history, not much revealed, you know, kind of little fragments that we've collected, but it really comes into its own as a place of significance in 1977 and after when a club, a, a club opened there called Pokies, which had performance and disco and a piano bar, dreadful food uh, and drag. It had these drag shows, but of a really unique style, something that had only been seen rarely in Melbourne before and not much since. It was highly produced, costumed, rehearsed. It was a kind of drag show that, uh, had, that really attracted crowds. This was a once a week Sunday night event, I guess, um, and they attracted anything up to a thousand people. You know, it was really an enormous, uh, enormously important part of, of Melbourne life in the, in the 70s and into the 80s. It's remembered as the kind of place that gay men and lesbians could take their mums. The fun was a little bit naughty, but not too confronting and not too upsetting. And I think that was part of its appeal for, for lots of people. We often talk about the past as being a foreign country, um, but it's worth remembering that it's not always as foreign as we might think. The slogan, one of the great slogans of the same-sex marriage campaign was love is love. Um, and we see evidence of that going back to the 1919-1920 period in letters between Harry Bruin and Benjamin Morris. Uh, these letters reveal very clearly uh, the experience of love in a very recognisable kind of way. Um, Uh, in, in one of the letters, uh, one of them writes to the other, we are going to bloom together in a hothouse of love, sympathy and understanding. Um, it's not exactly grinder talk, is it? This is, this is very much a kind of traditional romantic expression. And it's quite an important evidence of how men might have expressed their love for each other, and presumably often did, but these ones happen to survive. They survived because Benjamin Mor Ben Morris's um, a woman decided to blackmail Harry, who was the older and well more well off um, member of the relationship, decided to blackmail him. She got her hands, she got hands on the letters, uh, decided to blackmail Harry for money. Uh, when he refused to pay, she went to the police uh, in a kind of very vindictive sort of way. Uh, the police took the letters, uh, arrested Harry and Ben, and took them to court. So the letters are evidence of the existence of love in a very kind of recognisable way, quite rare evidence of that. But it's also evidence of the way in which the police worked. You know, the law mattered here because their relationship was against, well, their, their sexual relationship was against the law. The police were in a position to arrest them. Although having said that, when they got to court, the court refused to believe the woman who tried to blackmail them. She was not a particularly convincing witness. Um, nor was there actual evidence of the only legal offence they could be charged with. 
which was indecency or buggery. They talk about love, but they don't actually talk about their sex life. And that, in fact, is what's saying. It's also evidence of the importance of the state uh, as a means for preserving our history for us. This stuff is now in the public records office. Uh, because it was seized by the police, it was used in evidence and then just passed into police records and eventually to the state archives in Victoria. So it's a quite an important and really quite moving in, uh, description of what was happening. But once you start to go further back, we're looking for intimacies rather than identities. You know, there's no evidence that Ben and Harry identified themselves with other people like them, for example. Um, whereas by the time you get to um, the Prince of Wales, it's clear that camps are gathering as camp people looking for each other. The further back you go, the less that becomes true. And I think by the 19th century, we're looking for intimacies rather than identities, physical intimacies, intimacies, emotional intimacies, or both. And we're looking for objects and places that reveal people who lived lives other than those dictated by social norms around sex and gender. And that's the kind of hook, I think, for our interest and our sense of these uh, significance. But that, of course, means that was going to be quite complicated to make sense of what was going on in the past. And we have a really interesting example of that with this brooch um, and with the house corridor that Marina was talking about. The brooch and the house belonged to Anne Drysdale and Carolyn Newcomb. Uh, and when Drysdale died in, in the early 1850s, uh, Carolyn took locks of both of their pieces, both their hair, and gave them to a, a craftsman, a jeweller, who bound them together into this brooch that you can see here. All those tiny little silver filaments, not the gold, but the little kind of greenish silvery filaments, they are in fact the hair, I've been worked up in, in that sort of way. This, is, this creates a sort of interesting story for us to, to explore. I mean, at the, at the most obvious level, Coriol has an architectural significance, which is easy to explain, and that's why it's on the Heritage Register. Mm. Ditto with the brooch, which is an extraordinary piece of work. But it speaks also to the rituals and practices around death in a particular social class in a particular time. Um, but the story for us, in terms of our heritage, <coughs> excuse me, and our significance, is the relationship between Drysdale and Newcomb. And what can we make of that? The two were business partners. They took up land down near Geelong in the 18, 30, 1840s, uh, and they were known as the lady squatters. You know, so, so remarkable was it that two women would go off and create a kind of agricultural business that they were uh, widely uh, acknowledged as sort of a notable couple. Um, they were certainly business partners, but there's very much more to their lives than that. I mean, they built Coriol for themselves, having previously built a, a smaller house. They lived together in that house. Uh, Drysdale kept diaries in which it's very clear that they were in each other's lives every day. You know, they were clearly, uh, their lives were tangled up in each other. And when Newcomb died, she was buried with Drysdale in a, in a common grave. This creates a sense of intimacy that is quite striking for us. And the fact that it's intimacy between two women is what leads us to start to think about drawing them into this particular story. We've been accused, criticised for calling them lesbians, uh, which interestingly we have never done. And it's striking, I think, that people think that we have. Because lesbianism is a particular identity that might be traced to the 19th century, but mostly uh, to the early 20th century, particularly, for example, in Paris. But there's is an intimate relationship between a companionship and partnership. At one point, Drysdale writes in her diaries that she hopes that they will be partners forever. And the context for that is not a discussion of the business, but of their sort of lives together. Um, these are the kind of uh, emotional relationships, the emotional intimacies that we are starting to claim for ourselves without claiming to know anything about their sex life or their identities. 
uh, in any sort of modern sense. I think from our point of view, um, like it or not, this, this relationship speaks to us, uh, to, to romantics as well as to historians. I'm going to stop there because I'd like to leave time for questions and, and so on. Um, so, James, back to you. Thanks, Graham, and, and thanks to you both, Marina, as well, for that, for that fascinating presentation. Uh, a message came through privately um, saying how amazing that, that brooch is. I think yes. I got to see it. I was really excited. Um, and uh, while the presentation's been going, We've been having questions coming through as well. So I'm going to put up the link again. Uh, and there's been a few that have been, been voted on as well. So in the interest of democracy to start, I might read out the um, most popular question. It's been asked in a couple of different ways as well. Uh, and so the question is to, to read it out. What it says uh, here is, there, that question whether there was no community recognition prior to the 1980s, I think picking up on something you said at the start, um, and then goes on to say, because it's not recognised and even hidden, doesn't mean it didn't exist, um, and how do you address that challenge? Um, and I suppose I'm going to group together with another very quite similar question. Uh, how are you addressing some more of the hidden aspects of the community, such as Camp Inc and Society 5, um, and say gay liberation starting in 1972, and how do you work with this idea of of, of community per se, a very complex idea, of course, Graham. Yeah. Um, yes, my sense of the, the kind of chronological periods is that there are certainly people, men having sex with men, women having sex with women, uh, all through our history and in any society about which we know anything at all uh, in the past and present. Uh, the notion of community, though, I think is a kind of development from... Um, it's a way of living that is very different to the way that of living that existed in the 19th or the early 20th century. It's true that in the 40s and 50s you can go to places like uh, the Prince of Wales. There's like a number of, of pubs around Melbourne. There are private parties where people seek each other out. So you can see in the 60s the emergence of, which I call a subculture, where people know each other, work together, uh, sorry, socialise together. Um, in 69-70, you get the emergence of a, a very visible political organisation, Daughters of Miletus, Campaign Against Moral Persecution, Gay Lib, Radical Lesbians and so on. Um, but by the late 80s, some of those bars that had existed often kind of very, rather discreetly, this is, you know, emerges in the 70s. By the late 80s, it started to intensify and you've got a whole series of places and activities that I think constitute a community. So I'm certainly not saying that there weren't people doing homosexuality, if you like, or feeling it or desiring it, but the organisation is, is, I think, a particularly a particular period. Marie, do you have anything to, to add? You're muted, Marina. Ah. Uh, I've asked to unmute you. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's an, another question that's that's as people are going on that seem to be people seem to be voting to have asked, getting get growing in popularity. Uh, were any locations of objects significant for the non-Anglo LGBTIQ community of Australia found through the project? Um, were there special efforts made to seek out spaces popular for previous migrant communities um, within the consultation progress of the day within, I suppose, the project more generally? Um, yes, there were efforts. Uh, they haven't been very successful. Um, people will be aware, of course, the waves of migration, the, the Chinese in the 1850s, and then not again until uh, really the, uh, after the Vietnam War in the 1970s. So a lot of the evidence for migrant communities comes from the 80s and 90s. Um, but some of the, the ones that came in the post-war period, you know, Greeks and Italians start to speak for themselves, really beginning in the 1980s. The 70s tended to be, we're all in this together. By the 1980s, as things loosen up in society, people feel more confident to speak and to speak about their difference from this kind of the generalised gay and lesbian person. 
Uh, and then, of course, AIDS becomes important. It's really important to reach out to non-English speaking groups in order to get them to uh, understand what's going on and to change their behaviour. There is a little bit of evidence for the gold fields, um, but not much for the Chinese in the gold fields. Although that's, less, that's in Queensland, there is. I mean, Clyde Moore's book on Queensland is really important for, the, for those periods. Something, if I could add to that, is that um, you do get groups like, you know, Greek and gay, Arab and gay, you get um, people meeting, but whether, um, you know, and this this is well known, I think Greek and gay had its, you know, an anniversary dinner recently, um, but whether it's attached to a heritage place is another matter entirely. Um, I, know, I know that... Um, Graham, did you want to speak about Peter Warple's Crow's Cloak? Uh, yes, I can do that a little bit. Um, he is a, a Aboriginal artist um, uh, and has... Actually, now that I think about it, I don't know when it was produced, but relatively recently, produced what's called a cloak of visibility. Uh, and it's made on the one hand with possum skins in a kind of traditional style, but the inside is kind of lined with rainbow to reflect the rainbow flag. That's something that's going to go into the Pride Centre in due course, um, but it is one of the few very visible manifestations of Indigenous queer identities. There are certainly queer people, who would call themselves gay and lesbian, Wayne King, Noel Tovey, uh, and so on, uh, finding places or objects to attach their stories to is, is in fact difficult. And that's in a sense the the good thing about the emphasis on places and objects is it forced us to try harder, you know, to go looking beyond. We could easily do events and people, but the, um, you know, we wanted to make sure we touched a number of bases in terms of regional, suburban and inner Melbourne, but also the various kind of faith groups, ethnic groups, uh, sexual practices and preferences and so on. Um, and, and we've been relatively successful with that. I, I also just think that um, some um, people from cold, non-English-speaking migrant backgrounds, um, there are some places that are irrelevant to everyone in the community, whether it's Hairs and Hyenas Bookshop, the Prince of Wales, um, some venues everybody goes to. So, you know, if you if we have also tried to represent the L, the G, the B, the I, the... T and the and the Q. So if you look at bisexual people, bisexual people are moving through many of these places, whether or not you know their their identity is, is visible at any given time. I suppose that was one of the questions as well, whether there's been specific challenges in addressing uh, the representation of different parts of the community too. Can we talk about that a bit, Marina? Um, maybe you start off and I'll see what I can add. Yeah. Um, so we were very clear that we wanted to represent through the LGBTI and the Q, um, but we wanted to make sure that that didn't exclude other kinds of identities. The archives has a very broad collecting policy uh, and that was reflected in our, our search. Um, the difficulties were the extent to which those identities were visible before the 80s, the 90s, and so on. And, of course, they're still emerging. Uh, and then attaching them to places and objects as opposed to people kind of emerging and socialising. And I think that created, a, that created difficulties and we haven't always been able to address everything. But I th we have got a very good spread of, of kind of the diversity of, of the queer world. Another question that's been asked in a couple of different ways is uh, in terms of archival methodology uh, and the ways and words that people use to talk about LGBTQ people have shifted. Uh, how does this affect the research? And a specific example was provided in another question, um, such as intimacies versus identities and that specific idea uh, and the shift from an ascribed identity uh, to an ascription of a negative or criminal association to the more liberatory narrative that's, I suppose, 
reflected in more recent literature and ideas. Uh, sorry, can you do, do that again? So the, I suppose it's a question in two parts. The first is around uh, the, the effect of the of archival research given the changing language, and then secondly, the ascription of positive and not negative uh, associations with those forms of identity as well. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, the, the language is... I mean, it's a problem for historians generally, you know, do we describe men having sex with each other in the 16th century or the 19th century as gay? Um, I prefer not to, some people prefer to do that. The acts are, to the extent that we can tell, are the same, but it's the, it's the identities that's important. Sometimes when we don't know what the acts are, we're kind of attributing or assuming. So Harry and Ben, for example, because their letters don't, say anything incriminating, we don't know for certain that they had sex. Um, we have no idea at all whether uh, Newcomb and Drysdale would even have considered having sex, or maybe they just did it and just for obvious reasons didn't write it down. There's a very famous diary from England in the 1830s by one called Anne Easter, who wrote copious, literally millions of words in her diaries, whole slabs of which are in code when you break the code, you discover there are explicit descriptions of her sexual behaviour, which is unambiguously uh, lesbian in that sort of behavioural sense. Unfortunately, Andrew Osdown didn't keep code at sex and territory. So we start to talk about, well, why do their lives matter to us? If we can't be sure that they were having sex, what's, what, what's the significance? And the significance, I think, is the clear evidence of emotional intimacy, and that's true for Harry and Ben, as it is for Drysdale and Newcomb. Uh, in terms of the positive and negative spin on language, I mean, this is basically unresolvable. Some people will violently object to some words um, and others will violently object if you don't use them. You just have to kind of make your way through those shoals. And really, I try not to give offence, I try not to take offence, and that's really all you can do, I think. So uh, another one which is a lot of people are looking for an answer to, another question, uh, that they, first they anonymously described as a wonderful project and then continue to ask how the, how the project has been received by museums and heritage sites. Uh, are they increasingly likely to represent queer heritage in their collections and sites or has someone, someone upvoted it while I'm not reading it? Uh, and, and, or has there been a pushback from the uh, body still resisting the recognition of this, this clear past? There certainly hasn't been a pushback. This is the golden age for queer history, um, and it affects the institutions as much as it does broader community interest. The Performing Arts Museum, State Library, the Museum of Victoria, um, I'm missing something, you know, the fact that Heritage Victoria initiated this uh, at the initiative of the, of the Labor government. It's, and it's not just Australia, this is an international phenomenon. People are um, interested in this and, and keen to build it in, to reinterpret their collections, to make them available to people interested in queer history. Uh, it's not, I think we've asked, Thinking the other day, I think we've had two criticisms of the project at all. Both were on that Engage Victoria website um, and they were tremendously convincing, to be honest. And so the next question I'll ask is, have, have there been any challenges in, in terms of representing particular communities? Uh, and the one listed here is, is, is bisexual history. Uh, but another uh, another one which has kind of come group which has kind of come through that is uh, in terms of uh, uh, trans and gender diverse identities as well. Can I maybe just um, set up set up that question that the I think the three groups we were most concerned about can sometimes be described as the bits the B's the I's and the T's okay the bisexual intersex and transgender. Um, because these groups can move invisibly or, uh, I suppose, marginalised within a marginalised group. Um, I'm, I wrote the bisexual entry um, and 
Bisexual people are everywhere in the community, even though they might not identify as, as such. But one thing we did find in the um, Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives holdings and also at the State Library was a newsletter um, produced by uh, Bisexual Awareness Melbourne in the 1990s. And that was when um, I suppose there was a big um, uh, explosion of bi pride and bisexual being claimed as an identity post gay liberation. Um, in terms of places, though, bi people go to Club 80, bi people go to the Prince of Wales, bi people, bi people are everywhere. So, unless you sort of, and trans people go everywhere as well. So, uh, uh, that's, um, I'll throw to Graham for trans and intersex. And that's just, sorry, I suppose the question has just come through is also asking about asexuality and, and aromanticism as well. Yep. Um, in terms of intersex is a really interesting one because you would think prior to the present it would have been very difficult to find. Um, so at, but what you've got is these two, two cases or two places or objects that we want to include uh, that's relevant to intersex people. One, of course, is Tony Briffer, who is, uh, was mayor of Hobson's Bay and an openly intersex person both before and during their time in that position. The other case we have comes from the very early years of the, the 1900s, uh, a woman whose marriage was dissolved and when her great nephew to set out to find out why this rather unusual behaviour or action happened, uh, finally ended up with clear proof that she was in fact an intersex person. Uh, that she was um, unable to have sex with her husband uh, and therefore the marriage was annulled by the Supreme Court in a file that was locked up in perpetuity, although, of course, he managed to get it. Uh, and that reflects, that reflects changing attitudes. Trans, of course, is very broad. I mean, it starts with Seahawks, for example, in terms of political organising. Um, but we have a lot of, in 1975, which was for transvestites, most of whom identified as heterosexual. Uh, and then from there, a flurry of, of, of new identities kind of captured under, under trans. Um, the earlier manifestations in terms of drag, for example, uh, there's a lot of that around, uh, but a drag, for example, where the point is to pass. You know, you get a man will dress up as a woman, go out in public for the day, uh, go shopping, go to the cinema, uh, in order not to be detected. Of course, we know the ones who were because that's how we have these, these cases. So a uh, trans, because it so, is so diverse, that can be easily seen as a practice in, in part, you know, dressing differently, uh, is something that we have been able to identify. And, of course, the emergence of trans as an identity in the 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, has created not a lot of places, but some objects. Uh, I have not found objects. Uh, objects is a bit odd because if you can find a leaflet or a poster, you've got some evidence and that can be an object. Um, we haven't yet found anything around asexuality, but that might just be because the archives has been closed for the pandemic and I haven't been able to get there and rummage through the collection. There's been a few kind of statutory related questions. Um, just a very quick one and then I'll set, ask a second question as well. The first one is why haven't there been listings directly out of the process? Uh, but then the Sorry. why there haven't been listings directly out of the process, why it's being mediated through the report? Oh, why it's not the heritage register, do you think? Yes. Uh, what, what I'd say to that is we haven't finished the study yet. Um, and let's let's see what happens. There could be listings that come out of this report. So I think that adds to, might answer another question. Is so if you think it comes out and you want to nominate something, if if um, people uh, when the report comes out. If they wish to make a nomination to the Victorian Heritage Register or the overlay. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that Alga's own collection is of state-level significance. 
Um, you know, I think Heritage Victoria has to look very closely at the report and see see what does have state level significance. Um, but I think if if we just did a, a um, report which was only identifying places of state level significance for the overlay, we wouldn't kind of get the depth and the breadth that we're we're getting, and the the sort of the calibration and the the spectrum of of heritage. Am I right to say then that the the hundred the report isn't complete yet, and we don't know the one hundred places? It's going to be a surprise. Um, oh, <laughs> surprise! But it has been um, it hasn't been completed yet. But um, I don't. It's not a secret. We Graham could. Um, he's happy to share some examples, more examples of places and objects. Well, I've had, I've had, I've had, I had a couple of questions, sorry. Um, one, one is whether Penny's Night at the Pokies was there, and another one is whether there are medical sites listed there, listed like a, a Middle Park Clinic and Fairfield Hospital. Yes, Penny's is. It's attached to the Prince of Wales. Um, and it's a, it, it's a separate it's a separate event, separate night, uh, organised by Jan Hillier and Penny Austin. So, yes, it, it, it's in there. Uh, and often that's what you're doing, these kind of particular nights and particular venues. Medical stuff, uh, the Royal Children's Hospital came up around intersex. The, the VD Clinic in Little Whatnot Street has disappeared, otherwise we probably could have attached things to that. People did suggest that as a, as a place. Um, AIDS, HIV AIDS comes up a few times around objects like Victorian Red Ribbon, the quilt uh, places, positive living centre and so on. What's the newest object or location considered? The newest? Uh, one of the joys of this is that, you know, generally speaking, heritage objects and places need to have been around for quite a long time and kind of establish themselves. Um, we're not bound by that. We don't, they don't have to be incredibly old. I have a secret plan to include an object, a place 101, which would be the Victorian Pride Centre. I think that's going to be significant, even if it's not finished by the time we release the report. Um, so it could be if the first heritage study that includes something that hasn't been built yet. Yes, yes. Hasn't been finished yet. <laughs> I think they're stretching heritage to breaking point, but that's okay with me. I, th I think it really has to, it has to go in though. Yeah. Are there for those of you, yeah, for those of you, you who don't know, the, um, the there is a new Pride Centre going in in St Kilda. It will house the um, the switchboard helpline, the Gay and Lesbian Archives, and a whole lot of other queer services um, and be a real place for the community. Uh, are, are there plans for ongoing review or additions? No, there are. We have we talk at the archives a lot about what we're going to do with this. You know, we produce the report. Uh, it'll be published. It'll be online. We kind of hope people might feel inspired to pick up and run with some of the stuff for the heritage register. But we'd also like to do broader publications, you know, an, an electronic map of Melbourne or Victoria, really, uh, or a book or podcasts. We certainly want to use the material widely. We don't want it to be just the report. But there's been a few questions asking about that kind of ongoing engagement where the nominations are still available. I suppose maybe some people were interested in getting involved in some way in these discussions. The um, submissions closed on the 28th of February um, with the Engage Victoria site shot on the 28th of February. But if you really have something to say or feel like you could contribute um, or add additional information, please feel free to email Heritage Victoria or Graham directly because um, the, the project is still being shaped and um, go for it. It's tricky, isn't it, because you don't know what's on there, you don't know what's not on there. Um... 
If you're really passionate, email us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't be put off by that. <laughs> mm. And I, I, there's been quite a few questions and queries around re the represent, representativeness of the list that you're putting together um, mm. across across e every kind of various forms of representation. So, for example, yeah, yeah, uh, not just not just in terms of gender and queer identities, but also in terms of um, regional Melbourne um, in, in other other areas as well. We have tried to cover regions. I mean, the, the reality is that queer people, are, we're pretty much like everybody else. You know, we play sport, we go to medical clinics, we live in Melbourne, we live in regional Victoria, um, we go to the cinema, we go out to pubs. We, what else do we do? You know, the, the amount of diversity within the community is extraordinary. You know, to forget about the ever-growing alphabet soup. There's also I think, all the other ways that you can slice it as, as well. Um, we are trying to be very, very, very mindful of all these different ways you can slice it. But the cornerstone for us is, yeah, significance to the LGBTIQ community. So if you feel like there could... Actually, that was one of our questions on the Engage Victoria website. Do you feel that there is part of the community that could be in danger of being under, underrepresented? Um, and, yeah, pe people of colour, migrant groups was one that, that came up. One of the things we did at Midsummer, the Archives always has a tent at the carnival, uh, we had a big pin board with a map of Victoria and a map of Melbourne on it, and invited people to pin their, their ideas to that. Um, as a result of that, you know, in terms of regional Victoria, we've got Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, Yak and Danda, obviously. <laughs> uh, I just realised we can relocate something to Lake Entrance. Um, somebody said that uh, when he came up and he pinned something to Sea Lake in sort of Western Victoria, he said, except I was the only gay thing there and I've gone. So, you know, <laughs> that, that emphasises that point that actually... You know, we are everywhere, but we don't always leave visible signs. Uh, the suburb, in terms of where the physical places, central Melbourne comes up biggest, but that's partly because central Melbourne's been there longest. Uh, you get the outer suburbs, so beyond Fitzroy, beyond St Kilda, we've certainly got a reasonable number of cases, uh, and then to the regions, rural and regional Victoria. One last question, and this is, I think, directed at both of you. Do you have some favourites, objects or places in the collection or something that surprised you through this process? Rena? Um, I think one of my favourites was a place that I cycle past sometimes near where I live and I had absolutely no idea that it was a gay liberation centre. So um, I live in the North Carlton area and... Lo and behold, when I was starting to get involved in this project, I found out, I think it's 23 Davies Street, North Carlton, was um, Melbourne's first gay liberation centre where you could drop in, um, hang out, plan to overthrow the patriarchy and so on and so forth. It just looks like a normal terrorist house. You would never, ever know. And to me that's so representative of our history is that we're there, we're always there, we're always there, but we're kind of kind of hidden. Unless, um, you know, and, and I think this is a, a problem as well, is that we are overrepresented in state archives. You know, a lot of personal papers disappear, but because of our overrepresentation in state archives, we're often seen as, as mad or bad, which, you know, one of your questions was about negative representations because the state keeps all its records, police records are kept, court records are kept, hospital records are kept. We, we find ourselves in there, but that's actually quite a skewed archive. So, yeah, good story about the Liberation House, but, yeah, not so great about the skewing of archives because the state keeps them. Although we end up re-reading that stuff. I mean, I... Reading against the grain. Yeah, 80s kind of expression. But, um, yes, yeah, so, the, you know, the criminal records, clearly people were being 
treated like that because of their appalling and disgusting and offensive behaviour. We now read them much more closely for evidence of what was really going on. Mm. Don't have negative judgment around, you know, two men having sex and getting arrested. We think the problem is the cops and the courts. Now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have reshaped our history. Um, in terms of favourite, I have a hundred favourite pieces. So, um, but I guess my all-time favourite is a small handwritten poetry book about so big from 1920, posted from a man somewhere in uh, Australia to his friend in Lake's Entrance. And the poems, there's all sorts of different poems, war poems and humorous poems, but there's this bunch of love, love poems which are never explicitly homosexual, but love is always represented as he. You know, love, he comes to me in the night and his lips and so on. Um, it's inspired from my friend, his friend, which in the early 20th century was a kind of coded way of saying love, homosexual love. Um, and it's just a completely unique item. You know, somebody made it, wrote it all out, posted it to his friend. It ended up in a second-hand bookshop in Melbourne. Somebody picked it up and thought, hello, I know what this is, and it ended up with the archive. So the object itself and the way in which it found its way to a safe home where we can talk endlessly about it. Great. Thank you so much, Graham. Thank you, Marina. Uh, a few people have asked whether the, whether this evening's been recorded, and it is, and we'll be posting the video uh, on the Yakka Hutch website and the Melbourne School of Design YouTube page most likely in the coming days. And uh, maybe if we can, everyone join for a, a virtual round of applause. Uh, <laughs> if you know where to hit the uh, the, the clap button and on the reactions. Ooh, reaction screen. One last little technical challenge. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right.